Oh, yes. So, uh, yeah, so it's really my honor to have the chance to present my very recent uh, research uh, here. So thank you for the invitation. And yeah, so it's really recent. We actually just finished the draft uh, last week. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so I think it's a good time for me to uh, to present this and get some feedback and maybe try to go back to maybe some modification. OK, so uh, in this talk, we're going to uh, kind of try to uh, maybe give possibly a different perspective towards systemic risk, right? So we try to say uh, partial information, right? So with something we deal with every day alone can just trigger systemic risk. So this joint work with uh, Di Xian Sun, who is in uh, National Central University in Taiwan. So let us first have a very brief uh, uh, literature review, right? So I'm going to present some, uh, some of the papers uh, so a short list of papers here, but certainly that's a very, very short list. Okay, so there are still many other important papers in this direction, right? So I think to me, right, so a very important paper is, this, so this one by Fulk and Swen in 2013, right? So where they propose a homogeneous interbank lending and borrowing model. It's a very simple tractable model and there's no control, right? So they just say, oh, so I just assume these banks will interact like this, no control. And just in this very simple model, they uh, show that systemic risk can naturally occur, right? So with some probability, and you really cannot ignore that. And people quickly upgrade this model, right, by adding some different kinds of controls to make it more realistic, and even try to deal with uh, more general kinds of reserve processes for each bank, and so on, and try to make uh, the entire model more and more realistic. And all this work, right, so all, so all the work here, right, largely focus on homogeneous uh, interbank lending and borrowing. And in more recent years, right, so people have tried to uh, capture more heterogeneity among banks. So for example, so people try to uh, say, right, so these banks can have different reserve dynamics and different cost structures, and even uh, some different capital requirements, or maybe try to model their different locations in a banking network, right? So some banks may be the core in the network and some maybe on the periphery and so on. And all these different things can uh, make uh, some, some different implications towards systemic risks and how it occurs and how we can possibly mitigate the risk. And the underlying thesis here for all these studies is that interbank transactions trigger systemic risk, right? So, th so that's of course, right, so kind of um, so our consensus now, and that's why we want to have so many different kinds of models trying to understand interbank activities. And our main ideas for these um, research is that um, we actually believe systemic risk to be more general than this, right? Because um, systemic risk um, should apply to the entire financial system. And the interbank market is just one specific sector in the entire system, right? So it's likely that systemic risk is triggered by uh, other parts of the financial system and is outside of the interbank market, right? So essentially, what we really want to answer is the following question. Can other kinds of transaction outside of the interbank market trigger systemic risk? Right, so we really want to see, oh, so can we build out a model and that's not so related to the interbank market, but somehow I can still see uh, systemic risk occur, right? So, so in this different model. So in this talk, right, so we're going to consider a kind of um, standard model of investment, right? So, so we have an optimal investment model for N investors. So here our focus is only their optimal investment uh, behavior, right? And there's no interbank activity being modeled, right? So we kind of don't care so much about the interbank uh, transactions and the end investors in our model, they just do, they just try to do their optimal investment strategies, right? So they don't really borrow or lend money from each other, okay? And just in these rather standard uh, investment setup, we can show that um, there's actually kind of a new cause for systemic risk that people maybe didn't uh, notice so much. And that just partial information as we will see. Okay, so we just jump right into our model, 
right? So we assume that there are N investors and you can imagine that there are uh, N fund managers and they're trading a specific stock, right? So given by this dynamic right here, so we have the uh, the expected return mu and also the, uh, the volatility coefficient sigma. And they're doing their trading on a finite time horizon capital T. And of course, the corresponding wealth process for investor I is the following. Right, so here we have the risk free rate R, so that's given, and we have the risk premium mu minus R, and that's multiplied by the trading strategy pi I. Right, so investor I choose the trading strategy, and that's naturally the corresponding uh, wealth process. And we're going to assume, right, so this sigma and this risk free rate R are given, so it's known to all investors. But mu, uh, for a large part of this talk, it's only partially known. And we will make that precise later on. And one key uh, key consideration is uh, the relative performance criterion, because if you look at the previous slide, if I just say I have the like, the stock even like these, and then so the wealth process is just that, then uh, so it's so it seems that right investors are not really related to each other they can kind of individually solve their optimal investment problem independently from one another, right? So we have to have some kind of modeling element to make their choice of trading strategies connected to each other. So that's the relative performance criteria. So we say investor I not only cares about his terminal wealth only, right? So X side of T is his terminal wealth. He also consider uh, his performance relative to to uh, to all investors. So that's why he considered these relative risk performance, right? So his terminal wealth minus the average wealth of all investors at the terminal time capital T, right? So we have the X bar defined like these. So he considered these two things simultaneously. So, he, so eventually he considered these mixed criterion, right? So, so it's basically a weighted average of these two parts, right? So he chose these lambda I, so that's a given constant chosen by investor I, right? So, so that's a number between zero and one. And then eventually, right, so he plays this mixed criterion into a mean variance objective. So we have the mean and variance part there. And so here, so this thing right here is basically just this mixed criterion, right? Because you have minus lambda x and then plus lambda x. So these two terms just cancel. So eventually you only have these things left in main and in variance. And here, right, so we additionally allow the possibility of two different lambda values, right? So you can have different lambda values here and there. So of course, we, we so we can take them to be the same, right? But just mathematically, we don't really uh, need that. And in practice, right, so some people, some investors may want to consider these relative criterion when they're doing this mean maximization here, but for variance, some investors may just care about, I want to control the variance of my own terminal wealth, right? So in this case, they, they would like to take this lambda to, to be zero, right? So this is kind of fundamentally why we uh, want to allow these two different uh, values of lambda. Okay, so that's the problem setup, right? So each investor has these uh, mixed criterion including these uh, uh, relative performance compared with the average wealth. And they put that into a mean, uh, mean variance problem right here. Okay, so of course we're not the first one introducing this relative performance criterion. So in the previous paper by, by, by Espinosa and 2Z and also by Lacker and Zerofopola, they already consider this mixed criterion but they put it under the, util the utility maximization framework and they uh, managed to solve a Nash equilibrium for these N investors. So we're now putting things under a mean variance objective. Okay, so let us now say a little bit more about how we uh, uh, formally partial information. So first we assume that investors observe the evolution of the underlying stock S but they don't really know mu precisely. They don't really know the expected return mu of the underlying stock precisely. So they can only do, uh, so, so what they can only do is try to infer it, 
derived from their observation of the stock S. And to make things more tractable, we're going to make the following assumptions. And our analysis will break into two different scenarios. So first, the assumption is that investors actually know mu will take two values, either mu1 or mu2. They know these two values. And we assume that mu1 is larger than mu2. But of course, they don't know precisely uh, what mu actually is. They only know these two possible values. And our analysis will uh, break into the following two scenarios. In scenario number one, right, the underlying mu is a fixed constant. Okay, so it's a real number. So in this case, it seems that so, so it's not a very difficult problem, right? Because investors only need to infer the true value of mu between mu1 and mu2. Okay, so this particular scenario applies to a stock with unreported innovation. So in the market, right? So so there are a lot of companies who actually uh, do some innovation, but they never report in their financial reports. Okay, so for those companies investors really need to uh, try hard to infer whether it has done some innovation and whether the innovation is successful or not, right? So they're trying to infer whether this, uh, some innovation is successful so that the expected return can jump from mu2 to a larger value mu1. So that's kind of scenario number one. And for scenario number two, um, that, so, so that's the case where the underlying mu actually alternates between the two VLU, mu1 and mu2. So eventually we're, we're going to model the as follows, right? So mu is equal to mu of some continuous time Markov chain, right? So basically the Markov chain here has two states, uh, one or two. So when the state is one, then the mu VL is the larger value mu1. And when the state is two, then mu takes the, the lower value mu2, right? So of course, that corresponds to um, to the changes, the, the repeated changes between good states and bad states. So, so essentially changes between the bull and the bear market. So in this case, the, the task for the investors is a little bit more challenging because they have to infer the recurring changes of mu between these two values. Okay, so these are the two specific scenarios uh, of partial information we're going to focus on in this talk. Okay, so our goals is the following, right? So we're going to find a Nash equilibrium strategy, right? So this is a two point of trading strategy for the end investors. And we want to find such a Nash equilibrium under full information case where mu is observable and also under the partial information case, which is under the previous two scenarios I just mentioned. And the question we specifically want to answer is that so once we know the natural equilibrium under full information and under partial information, we can then see precisely how investors' wealth change from the full information case to the partial information case. And then we will see that, oh, so actually once we consider partial information, then the wealth of investors will be significantly reduced to the extent that a lot of defaults will happen. Okay, so before we actually um, present our mathematical result, we actually have to think about the following question in more detail. What constitutes a Nash equilibrium in the current setting? So initially we thought mm, that should be quite easy, right? So it's just N players and we want to find an N, uh, so, so we want to find an, a Nash equilibrium for this N player game, that should be really obvious how we should define that. But if you really think about that, that's not so trivial because of the mean variance objective. So, so this objective will trigger time inconsistency. So eventually there will be um, a two intertwined levels of game theoretic reasoning. So at the interpersonal level, of course, investor I needs to select a strategy pi I in response to other investors' training strategy. That's at the interpersonal level. At the same time, this chosen strategy pi i actually needs to additionally resolve time inconsistency among the investor's current and future self, right? Because under time inconsistency, triggered by the main variance objective, um, um, so 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 it's hard to find a strategy that can be agreed upon by the current self of investor i and his future self. 
right? So, so this pi i strategy chosen at least needs to resolve time inconsistency. So, so it needs to at least um, um, achieve certain intro personal equilibrium among this, uh, this particular investor's current and future self, right? So that just means that, right? So when investor I choose a response to other investor strategy, his chosen response has to be an intrapersonal equilibrium strategy so as to resolve time inconsistency within himself. So that's why eventually we define um, a natural equilibrium in our present setting as follows. So we say pi star, so this two-port of strategy is a natural equilibrium for our problem if the following holds for any given i, right? So here, so I have the ji function, and remember that ji is just the mean variance objective. So that's computed given the current time and the current state. So here, x is an m vector that represents the wealth, uh, the wealth levels of all the investor. And then, so this is given. So this part is basically the uh, the trading strategy of other investors. So. When I compute, right, so these mean variance value here, investor I right here is using pi i star. And for the second term right here, investor I is actually choosing a different strategy, right? So here I saw so this notation right here, right? So it's, so it's the concatenation of two different controls, pi and pi i star, and they're concatenated at a time point t plus h. And remember that the current time is small t. So it's basically saying that after time t plus h, my future selves will be used in pi star. And that's given, I, I cannot change that. And what I can do is I can control my own strategy from my current time t to t plus h. So in this very tiny, tiny time interval, right? So, so investor i is thinking about, oh, uh, so which uh, control I should choose, right? So in so in this initial small time interval, and this entire thing just means that, right? So he realized, right? No matter how he choose this trading strategy pi initially, is not going to be better, right? So it's so it's better for him just to follow um, this strategy pi i star, right? So that's essentially the meaning of this uh, relation right here. And of course, that's the, the, the standard definition of an, uh, an intrapersonal equilibrium uh, in the literature of timing consistent control. Uh, so we just follow that uh, right here. The only difference is that in the literature of timing consistent control, people mainly focus on one single agent, right? So here we have N uh, different investors, uh, uh, but the definition is essentially the same, right? So we impose this, right? So basically saying that, at any given time and in any given state, right? So given the other uh, the other strategies, investor I realized that it's better for him to stay with these particular strategy pi i star, right? So kind of his future self and current self reach an agreement. And we impose this for any given investor I. Okay, so essentially, right? So this national equilibrium definition means all investors achieve intrapersonal equilibrium simultaneously. And this particularly corresponds to uh, the notion of solved interpersonal equilibrium in my previous paper. And there we, we actually define an even stronger notion called sharp, in, sharp interpersonal equilibrium. And that will conform to the natural equilibrium idea even better. But it turns out that it's really hard to define in the present setting the mean variance problem. So we just stay with the solved version right here. Okay, so now let's jump into the mathematical result we have. And we first focus on scenario number one, where we assume the underlying mu is a constant. Okay, so we first present the full information result, right? So where we assume that the underlying mu is a constant and we actually see that, we know precisely what it is. And to state the result, we just need to introduce uh, some notation. So we have this uh, kappa i constant, is defined to be one divided by gamma i, and gamma i is the risk aversion coefficient. Um, okay, so let me maybe go back. Uh, I probably didn't mention that. Uh, it's actually just right in the mean variance uh, uh, problem right here, right? So this is just gamma right here that represents the risk uh, aversion 
coefficient of investor i. Okay, so this gamma right here. Okay, so we have one divided by gamma times these two terms, and they're related to this lambda i constant. So that's coming from the relative risk uh, performance consideration. And then you have this kappa bar, so that's the average of all the kappa i's, right? And then you have this lambda bar v, so that's the average of the lambda i across all the different investors. So when mu, so when the underlying mu is a constant and it's known, and naturally brain can be derived in our setting as follows, right? So pi i star is given by this precise formula. So we have the discount factor here, and then we have mu minus r divided by sigma square times this thing, right? So composed of all these kappa i's. And just notice that, right? So in the specific case where all the lambda i's are zero. So that's the case where you actually only focus on terminal wealth. You don't really consider relative performance criterion. So that's the classical setting, right? And then this formula would just reduce to these very simple form, right? So we have a discount factor times these, uh, um, so basically the Merton, uh, Merton ratio, right? So, and this is just the, um, um, precisely the, the, um, the answer to the classical mean variance problem when you only have one single agent. So here in our case, right? So it's a little bit more complicated, right? Because here we don't have just, so we don't just have gamma i, Right, so, so we have this kappa thing here, which is related to one divided by gamma i, but you still have many other things, right? So when you have lambda i being zero, you right away see that all. So, so this term and that term just become one. So it reduces to one divided by gamma i, and then we just, uh, so we just get this uh, very simple classical solution, right? But now because we have, uh, we really consider relative risk of, so, so we really consider relative performance criterion. So we see that that will come in here, right? And then we will see that, so your strategy here really depends on other investors in the sense that you have kappa bar. So other investors, uh, gamma will come into play here. And also you also have these uh, lambda bar here. So that means that, so other investors lambda i's will also come into play here. Okay, so that's the full information result, right? So then um, we can also have some uh, some more results, right? So under full information, right? So we can also derive the value function under the previously stated natural equilibrium. So for the mean variance value for each investor i, so we can also have quite explicit formula. But in this talk, we will actually focus more on the natural equilibrium uh, on the natural equilibrium formula. Okay, so now that's the kind of case where we actually have partial information, right? So remember that we still assume the underlying mu is a constant, but now investors just know mu can be either mu one or mu two, but they don't really see the actual value of mu. So in this case, of course, we can try to compute some posterior probability. So I define the posterior probability as follows, right? So this P hat J, so that's the probability that mu is equal to mu J, so J can be one or two, right? And you compute this probability given the evolution of the stock price process S. And we can now just right away apply some nonlinear uh, non filtering result and try to get some characterization for this posterior probability. Okay, so eventually, right? So, so the first step is that we try to introduce, right? So uh, a Brownian motion W hat defined like this. Okay, so every element here is actually observable, right? So the process to S, although I don't know the underlying uh, dynamics precisely, but I can observe them, right? And then I also have this P1 hat right here. And then other things are known constants, mu1, mu2, and sigma. So we assume that, right? So these are known constants, right? So I can define this thing based on my, uh, based on my observation. And then by the filtering theories, right? So this can be shown to be a Brownian motion. And the importance of this is that then we can make of these newly defined Brownian motion to reach a stochastic differential equation characterization for this posterior probability. So eventually it can be shown to be 
a, a unique, uh, the unique strong solution to these SDE right here. And you see that, right? So there's no trick term. You only have diffusion term. And, uh, and the Brown motion here is precisely uh, these newly defined one. And again, we see that, right? So in the SD right here, right? So it only depends on known constants, mu1, mu2, and sigma, right? And one important thing is that, right? So we so we can also analyze the SDE and show that, right? So 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 uh, so, the, so the unique strong solution will always lie between zero and one. So you would never really escape uh, this interval, which makes sense of these probability interpretation. Okay, so that's kind of our first first um, um, important result, right? So on the partial information, we can compute this posterior probability. And then, right, so for j equals to one, which means that you compute the probability that mu is equal to mu one, even your observation at the start. That particular probability satisfy this SDE. So eventually we can simulate that easily from this particular characterization. Okay, so the consequence is that, right? So once we know this process P, we can actually rewrite, rewrite the original dynamics of S, which involves the unknown constant mu um, um, in the following way, right? So we can just rewrite things in terms of the P process we just introduced, right? And so this line is actually so very easy to derive. You basically just look at this definition of Brown motion W hat you just do some basic algebra and some ETO formula. You can right away reach that, oh, S can be expressed as, as um, this strip term plus this Brown motion term. And remember that in the original, in the original uh, uh, dynamics of, uh, of S, this part is just mu. You have mu ST, uh, so you have mu times SU DU. And now the unknown mu is replaced by these mu1 minus mu2 times p plus, uh, plus mu2. And if we look at this, this is essentially just an average of, uh, of mu, right? So, so in the original dynamics, you have mu here, and you don't really know what it is. So now you try to estimate it, right? You know that there are two possible values, mu1 and mu2. So you try to compute an, an expected value for that based on your current posterior probability. Oh, so let me just go down to... So just basically, right, so you, so that's the probability that mu is equal to, to mu one. So you have that probability times mu one, and then one minus that probability times mu two. So that's essentially an estimate of the true value of mu. And correspondingly, the wealth process can also be expressed like these. So previously, you have mu minus r, and now you have these estimate minus r in your wealth process. So the nice thing is that now everything is observable, right? So in the dynamics of S and the dynamics of your wealth process, so everything is observable depending on this observable process P, right? So in this case, right, so we can kind of rewrite the mean variance objective under partial information as follows. Right, so at any given time, you also have these additional uh, variable p, so that so that represents the current posterior probability. Right, so that's how uh, so why we have this additional p right here, and your process x i just becomes the previous one we just presented, depending on this one. Right, so where you have this p process. Okay, so the definition of the natural equilibrium can just be modified correspondingly. We just, uh, so, so just the same definition as before, but we just include this additional p, uh, p variable here and there. Okay, so now we want to introduce, right? So we want to introduce a natural equilibrium formula under the current partial information setup. But before we can actually do that, we still need to introduce uh, some mathematical tools. Okay, because the eventual, um, a uh, formula will depend on uh, two Cauchy problems. So I have to introduce them first. So let's look at the first Cauchy problem. So we, so we have the domain Q defined like these, right? So we have the time variable from zero to capital T and also the state variable between zero and one. And to simplify my notation, I'm going to introduce the two functions theta and, and beta. 
defined like this. And notice that theta just corresponds to the estimate I mentioned right here. So theta the p is just this part right here and that part right there. And what is um, my beta function? Right, so beta is given by this. So beta just corresponds to the SDE satisfied by the positive probability. We can go back and take a quick look, right? So that's the SDE satisfied by the positive probability. And you see that this part is just beta of uh, the P prices. Okay, so now based on this theta and beta function, right, for each I, I introduced the following Cauchy problem. And here I additionally have uh, an eta function, which I don't specify precisely uh, right away here, right? So, so later on, right, so, we, so, so, um, so it will be clear, right, so what it should be. But for now, I just put it as a general function eta here to allow for some flexibility for, for subsequent uh, purposes. So you have eta here and you have beta function here and then theta here, right? So you have a parabolic equation here in your domain and you also have a terminal condition right there, right? So that's a Cauchy problem. And it's depending on I, right? So I say for, for any given I, I, I propose this Cauchy problem. And it, and it depends on I only through the constant kappa I right here, okay? So that's the only place where you have the I dependence. Okay, so of course we can try to right, solve these equations and try to get some uh, some results, right? So, um, so I probably want to go slightly faster. So let me just go straight down here. So we can even show that there exists a unique solution, small c, to this Cauchy problem. And this continues up to the boundary at the terminal time, capital T. And it also has these very nice stochastic representation. Okay, so of course, right, so this is done by elliptic regularization. So what, I, so what I mean by this is that if you look at the Cauchy problem, it doesn't seem so hard, but it's actually degenerate right? because your beta function here is not bounded away from the boundary zero, right? So we basically just uh, do some elliptic regularization. So basically it means that I, so we try to approximate, right? So this equation carefully by a sequence of uniform elliptic equation so that we can eventually show that the limiting solution actually satisfies these in some reasonable sense. And then once you have that, solution established, then we can just carry out some uh, rather standard Feynman cat type arguments to get this representation uh, here. So that's the first part of uh, the result, right? So we have a solution to this uh, Cauchy problem. And in the second part, right, that's a, so that's actually even more important for subsequent purposes in terms of numerical um, calculations and also financial interpretations. So we also study the derivative of C, right? So we consider the, the partial derivative in the, uh, so in the state variable P, and we can show that it's bounded and also satisfy this nice stochastic representation right here. And here, I want to emphasize that in this formula, we have this zeta process. And zeta is actually the unique solution uh, to the following SDE here. And this SD is a little bit non-trivial because um, it's an SD with random coefficients. You need to first have your P process plug in, right? So we first have, the, so the P process is the, um, the SD satisfied by the positive probability. You first plug in, uh, so, so plug it in here as part of your coefficients, and then you state this SD, right? So, so that's an SD with random coefficients so we can uh, so actually solve that. And then this gamma function and lambda function, they're actually related to the dynamics of a P. Okay, so remember that, right? So previously we already proposed the FD for P, but for the previous stochastic representation for the solution to Cauchy problem, we actually state that under a new metric Q. So under Q, our previous dynamics for P will become this one right here. And the only reason why I want to uh, uh, state it here is that I just want to let you know that. So in the dynamics of this zeta function, this gamma function and lambda function are just derivatives in P for the drift coefficient of P 
and then uh, the, the diffusion coefficient of p, right, stated above. So, so I basically just take the derivative of these function here and that function there. That's uh, how we um, um, uh, define this gamma and lambda function there. Okay, so now we have this precise formula for the first derivative of C and some key messages uh, is the following. So Zeta actually has some very precise meaning, right? So in the uh, so in the classical textbook, right, uh, stochastic French equation by Freeman, they already show that this Zeta function uh, is actually equal to, right? So these, uh, um, so, so, so this derivative of the P process with respect to the initial value. Okay, so that's actually shown by Freeman. Okay, so, so, so this Y, right? So in the dynamics of Zeta here, there is some very precise relation to the dynamics of P in terms of taking derivatives, right? And these process turns out to be the L2 limit of this thing, right? So you change the, the initial condition to P slightly, and then you compute the, uh, so you compute the, the derivative of that. And then we can further rewrite it, right? So we can look at this first part here and then rewrite it as the following form, right? So this one is like, I, so I start from time t and my current value is p plus h. But you can also say, I, so I just take my initial uh, value to be small p and I just wait until the time, tau h. So that's the time where my process start from p and then reach the value p plus h. You can wait until this time moment and then start to let your, your time variable to, to run, right? So you can just write this thing equivalently as that. So in this case, right, so if you look at this, uh, so this limit taken here, so you always start, uh, so you always start with P, right? And then when H goes to zero, the stopping time tau of H will also go to zero. So which means this thing in some sense uh, computes the rate of change of the process P at the, so at the current time point U. Okay, so that so that just means that, right? So we can have kind of at least intuitively, right? So certain understanding of how the, the, the volatility of the P process, which corresponds to the positive probability can affect uh, the Zeta uh, process and which will in the fact, uh, so which will in turn affect the VLU to this first derivative right here. Right, so if P turns out to be really volatile, then, right, so this rate of change should be large. So which means Zeta should be large. So if we go back to the partial C formula, so when this thing is large and other things are constants, and this is the boundary process. So when this thing is really large, then the whole thing will be large. So that's why we have this kind of conclusion here, right? So if my posterior probability process is really volatile, then the first derivative in, in small c will be large. On the other hand, if my P process is rather stable, then this rate of change is, it should be small, so zeta should be small. And then correspondingly, the first, deriv uh, the first derivative of small c should be small. Okay, so we just keep this thing as a record here, right? So, so we will refer to that uh, very quickly. Okay, so I can also have the second uh, uh, Cauchy problem stated here, right? But I probably want to just uh, briefly mention that it's depend uh, so it's dependent on um, the solution to the first Cauchy problem. So you see, you have this complicated term R i defined like this. It's kind of a long formula, and it involves all the uh, first derivative of C i everywhere. So it, so you need to first solve your first Cauchy problem and then state the second one. And luckily, right, so, so the proof for its existence and uniqueness is actually quite straightforward, right? So basically follow the same ideas as before for the first Cauchy problem. Okay, so now let us just um, describe, right? So our um, Nash equilibrium formula under uh, partial information, right? So a Nash equilibrium, so a Nash equilibrium formula uh, can be derived uh, like this. So that's the precise formula. So you see that, right? So the first term, right? So you have two terms. So that's the first term and that's the second term. And just remember that the first term here is actually very similar to the full information formula, right? In the full information trading strategy, we just have mu here, right? So we have mu minus r right here. 
but now on the partial information, I don't know what mu is. So I replaced it by the estimate at the P. Okay, so that's an estimate for mu. So that's the first term. And in the second term here, we see the small c function showing up. So remember that that's the uh, solution to the first Cauchy problem we just presented. And for our current scenario, scenario number one, where mu is a constant, we take eta to be zero, okay, in our Cauchy problem. So that's the CI function here, showing up here. And so let us say the bit about, right? So the functions, right? So the purpose of these two terms. So the first term, as we just mentioned, is identical with the full information trading strategy, except that the unknown mu is replaced, so it's replaced by the estimate theta to p. So and the estimate is based on your current posterior probability p. And the second term in the trading strategy just comes into play to make some adjustments based on the reliability of the current posterior probability. Okay, so why do I say so, right? Because when you have a posterior probability small p calculated at current time t, you don't really know whether it's really reliable or not, right? Because we know the posterior probability will evolve as an SDE, so it's likely that uh, as time passes by, it changes to some very different value. So you don't know how reliable your current uh, posterior probability value actually is, right? So if the current posterior probability is reliable, uh, that should mean your P process, as it evolves eventually, it kind of stay near the current value P. So the process P is kind of stable. So, so, so it doesn't go away from P uh, um, um, so, so wildly. In this case, we say the, the current price, so the current posterior probability is reliable. And when P is stable, as we just mentioned, the zeta process is small, and that just make um, the first derivative of CI small. And that just make the second term in our trading strategy small, right? Because the second term is composed of these partial CI, partial CI there. When they're all just small, the second term would just be very small. So that means that you have a very insignificant effect from the second term right there. When your, uh, your, 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 your current PVL is reliable. And on the other hand, if your current PVL is unreliable, which means that your P process eventually will be uh, um, oscillates really forcefully away from the current value P, then in this case, zeta should be large and then the partial CI should be large. So that means uh, the second term in your trading strategy should be large, right? So that means that in your estimate here, when P is actually not reliable, right? Then the second term comes into play to make a large adjustment. Okay, so now we can move on to the second scenario where we have uh, mu alternating between the two value mu one and mu two. But as we will see, the eventual result is very similar, right? So that's the stock um, uh, price dynamics right now. We have mu of this continuous time Markov chain M. So M goes from, uh, so changes between one and two, and that's the corresponding generator, right? So you have this Q1 and Q2, two uh, positive parameters. And then that's the corresponding wealth process for each investor. So yeah, so we can also define the corresponding mean variance objective. So now you have these M, uh, so at so, so any given time, right? So M represents the current state of the market. So, so, it's, e so it's either one or two. And then we also first derive the uh, the full information result. So that's where the M process is observable. And you see that we so we actually got the same Nash equilibrium formula, right, as before, right? So previously we have the constant mu, and now we just have a mu of M, right? So mu of the current market state. And then on the partial information, which means that investors cannot really observe the continuous time Markov chain M, so again, we consider this posterior probability, right? So that's the probability that mu of M is equal to mu J, J could be one or two, right? Condition on the evolution of the stock price process. And we can have very similar uh, stochastic differential equation characterization for this posterior probability. 
So we get this SDE right here. So we see that, right? So the diffusion coefficient is the same as the previous SDE in scenario number one, but now we have an additional drifter, right? So given by this, and you have these Q1, Q2 coming from uh, the generator of, uh, um, of the, uh, the, so of the Markov chain, capital N. Okay, so then the eventual result, right? So the Nash equilibrium formula under the case where uh, uh, so mu alternates between two value is exactly the same formula as before, right? So that's exactly the, the partial information formula as we presented in scenario number one. The only difference is that now this CI are solutions to a different Cauchy problem. A solution to the first Cauchy problem we presented before with a different eta function. And this eta function is just the additional drift, right? So, so look at this form, that is precisely the additional drift uh, in, in these uh, SD characterization for the posterior probability. Right, so essentially, right, so we have the same formula for Nash equilibrium on the partial information in scenario one and scenario two. The only difference is that this CI function just corresponds to a slightly different uh, Cauchy problem. Oh, so how much time do I still have? Uh, a couple of minutes. Okay, so Only I think a couple then, we want time for questions. Okay, okay, yeah. So then we let me just quickly go through some numerical results, right? So, um, so we first focus on an example um, under scenario one, right? So I take mu equal to mu one, and that's equal to point two, and so on. And mu two is much smaller. And in the picture here, I first present the wealth processes, right? So in the right, right? So the right plot, that's corresponding to the wheel processes under full information. And there should be 10 different curves, but there are, uh, so, so because here we assume we have 10 investors. So there should be 10 different wheel processes, but they're so close to each other. So it's, it seems that there's only one. So we see that the wheel starts from five and it gradually goes up um, and, 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 and none of them really default, right? And when you, we move from full information to partial information, right? Then we go to the left plot and we see that the wealth processes uh, is, uh, drops significantly. And some of, uh, so some of the investors really fall below the default level zero. And we can also tr try to see, right? See, see the corresponding trading strategy in more detail. So in the, uh, so in the plot right here, so the right one is actually the full information trading strategy. And then for the left one, right, the left plot here, that's the partial information trading strategy. So you can see that they differ significantly, at least for some initial time, right? From time zero to so all the way to time uh, four or five. So initially, investors kind of learn the true value of mean. So eventually they're really close to each other. Okay. But initially they're really, really different. So, so what so what we are doing right in the middle plot is that we really want to understand right um, which term in the partial information trading strategy drives the whole strategy away from the ideal trading level under full information. Right. So if you go back and and right, so and just go back a few slides, right? So the partial information trading strategy, uh, trading strategy has these two terms. So we want to see which one is the main culprit for wealth reduction and for systemic risk. So in so so that's why here in the middle plot here, I draw the plot of only the first term of pi i star, right? So it has two terms, and I only draw the first term. And it turns out that it's actually very similar to the full information trading strategy, and that's why if you look at the corresponding wealth processes in the previous slides they actually generate very similar wealth processes. So it means that, right, it is actually the second term, the second term in pi i star that really uh, drives the whole trading strategy away from the ideal trading level on the full information, right? So the main corporate is actually the second term. So then we just try to see why this is the case, right? So we look at the posterior probability P, Right, so we know that it satisfies a uh, certain SDE, so we can simulate that easily. So that's the picture right here, 
right? So that's the evolution of the posterior probability. So we see that it oscillates quite forcefully, right? But eventually, it so so, so it does converge to the right value. So it converts to one, which corresponds to mu being mu one, right? So it also is really you know, really vibrantly, but it generally moves in the right direction towards one fairly quickly, right? So, so you see that just after time one point five, you already reach the level point nine, and it basically just stay there and eventually converge to to one. Right. So it also is really forcefully, but generally moves in the right direction quickly. So if it also lays really forcefully, according to our previous discussion, right, then the first derivative of CI should be large. And that corresponds to the second term in our training strategy. So, so, so your second term is large. So that's why, right, so it generates a really big change in the training strategy. And then because it moves in the right direction quickly, right? So your estimate, right? So the P process move towards one fairly quickly and, and you stay there, right? So that means your estimate that type of P is really close to what you want to estimate, right? So, so, so it's really close to mu for most of the time. And that's why the first term in pi i star is actually really close to the full information trading strategy. And that's basically what we see here. Right. So just the first term and the full, full information case, they are really similar. Okay, so I also have um, some financial interpretation here for uh, for this phenomenon. Uh, I probably postponed that in the discussion if some of you are curious. And let me just very quickly, okay, so move on to the empirical loss distribution. And then we also just simulate uh, um, the whole thing 100 times, and then we have these corresponding loss distribution on the partial information and full information. And we see that on the full information, we never see default, right? So the probability of zero default is one, but once you go to partial information, right? So you see the defaults happen constantly and the probability that all investors default is actually quite high. It's like 35 or 36%. Okay, so the final words I want to say here is that we of course also have, um, have a different um, examples under scenario two, where mu actually alternates between these two values. And we can see some similar phenomenon, right? So these are the full information wealth processes, and these are the partial information wealth processes. And the interesting thing is that when we try to investigate the main culprit for, for this wealth reduction, we see that the main culprit changes from, um, so previously, right, so it was the, uh, so it was the second term in in our partial information trading strategy, right? And now it changes to the first term, right? So this is the full information trading strategy. And then we plot the first term in our partial information trading strategy. We already see that it's very different from the ideal trading level. And then, so that corresponds to these two different uh, wealth practices uh, plots, right? And if we add, right, so, so the middle plot here is just the plot for the first term in the partial information trading strategy. If we add also the second term to that, we just get very similar thing, right? So which means the second term doesn't really play a role here. And this can also be explained just by looking at the plots of the posterior probability, right? So now the posterior probability satisfies a different SDE. And if we plot it, it's actually, quite stable, it just stay at the same range. It doesn't really get close to zero or get close to one. And because it's rather stable, so that means that when P is stable, right, so partial CI is actually small, right? So that just make your second term in the partial information trading strategy small. And then because essentially you never really learn the true value of mean, right? So it kind of just stay at the uh, 0.5 level. It, so it doesn't go to one and doesn't go to zero. That means your estimate set of the P is really bad, right? Throughout the entire time. So that just make the first term in your trading strategy uh, a really bad um, um, estimate approximate for the ideal trading level under full information, right? So I think that's kind of interesting that we see systemic risk of, occurs in these two scenarios, but kind of for different reasons. Okay, so I probably just want to uh, stop here, right? So thank you very much for your attention and any questions is welcome. Thank you, Yuju. 
If there are questions, please uh, unmute yourself or raise your hand as appropriate. Uh, Jean-Pierre, please. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Uh, oh, thanks hi. for the talk. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about the systemic risk part of the title. I, I don't see where systemic risk is, if you can explain a little bit more. Okay, so what we uh, what we mean by systemic risk, or or at least what we understand, is that um, in a so in a so, so so in a model with multiple banks or or investors, right, and somehow um, they can default um, simultaneously or successively by some time capital T. So that's what we understand uh, in this work. What systemic risk. Uh, is that so? What where is the default in in a in model? So default means their wealth level fall below zero. Ah. Okay. 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 Yeah. So so so, but but I mean, in the original paper with uh, Leo, uh, yeah. systemic risk was related to a large deviation. So. Is there any large deviation behind it? Um, we have not yet, yeah, touched that part. Yeah, you know, we actually have some discussions, but in the current write-up, we actually have not included that part because we didn't okay. get very concrete results. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. So, in some sense, is the systemic risk here just coming from estimation causing everyone to align their portfolios? Uh, okay, say that again. So all of the different agents, they're all estimating based on the same data. And oh, that causes right. them to yeah. align their portfolios. And so you get a systemic sort of effect just through common portfolio. Uh, yes. So they basically, they, they have the same P process. Yes. So they basically, so it's kind of like they, they have the same P process. So it really depends on uh, how informative the P process can be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So I was wondering, it seems that you need for this model to work, you need a lot of symmetry so that every agent has exactly the same information. Because otherwise yeah. you end up with a dual effect where agents can act to, well, by watching different agents, you learn different things. And so you end up with a, a far more mm -hmm. complicated game. Is that right? Uh, yes, I think that's right. But I think the main uh, message here is that if, um, right, so if everyone can see the underlying dynamics clearly, then we don't actually see their wealth level only below zero that often. In scenario one, we never see that. In, in, in scenario two, it happens sometimes, but not so often. But once you have partial information, right? So you don't see dynamics right away, then we right away see uh, this default coming down very often. I think that's the main message, yeah. Yeah, I suppose I was just trying to understand at the game level that the partial mm -hmm. information has to really be uniform. Or the game so, breaks down. So you mean in terms of finding the Nash equilibrium, or well, the problem is if I start with better information than you, yeah, and we're both playing this game, you could learn by watching my actions more than what you learn from watching the stock. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. That means yeah. that I change your filtration, and so it all gets weird. Yeah, but but as long as none of the investors has perfect information, these phenomena should still occur, right? But uh, maybe uh, to a smaller um, extent, yeah. So, uh, Salah Meheran, please. Yeah, I want to ask about this, maybe uh, the, it's not correct, but if the number of the uh, dynamics equation goes infinite, because the sum problem always is related with the mean field system, like uh -huh. this FN. And is there any connection with this? Or maybe you can direct find the 
niche if we were employing. Mm -hmm. So we said the connection to the uh, N in infinity case. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, yeah, we actually have not yet done that yet. <laughs> we again have some, yeah, some write up that, yeah, we because actually- it, Because if the uh, N, N approaches infinite, it yes. go, this system go to mean field system and yes, we can yes. find by using a uh, niche approximate niche, niche equilibrium point. Yes, yes. Yeah, so so I totally agree with this. And I think at the very beginning, right, so I think my collaborator, uh, right, Leo Sun, um, actually first write down the uh, the mean field game formulation. But I just uh, uh, told him that uh, probably we can first deal with the finite uh, agent case. And then that's what we have right now. Yeah, but we do want to continue the, the mean field games uh, thing. Uh, but yeah, but I'm so it's but I'm sorry to say I really cannot say so much here because we have not really uh, uh, um, deal with the math uh, in a corresponding mean field game. So I don't want to uh, just make some predictions, right? Based on yeah, so based on very little uh, uh, knowledge of that. 